Welcome back everybody to me talking about stuff. And the stuff we're talking about here today is Stephen R. Donaldson essays on epic fantasy and maybe even about how they relate to his first chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever. We'll see how far we can get with this. So let's talk some theory, shall we? Cheers. All right. First thing first, there is a video by the um, incomparable Mr. Philip Chase, Dr. Philip Chase, Dr. Fantasy, out there on those essays. I'll, I'll link it down below, I promise. <laughs> and uh, I'll also try to link the essays. Now, that's a problem with those essays. And that is, Stephen R. Donaldson's website sucks. It, it really does. And it's kind of hard to get to those essays. So what I'll do is I'll link to the second one. Epic Fantasy, Necessary Literature, from 2015, which is on the website of the New York Science Fiction Review, um, a fantastic publication that you should go and, you know, support in all the ways that you can by, you know, reading their stuff and whatnot. And, yeah, this, <laughs> the first one, 1986 um, Epic Fantasy in the Modern World essay is linked in this essay, but you need to be careful because you might get a security warning when you try to download it from Stephen R. Donaldson's website. Be aware of that. It is kind of sucky. <laughs> anyway, there we go um, with the um, sort of things out of the way that I should probably have said. Um, let's, you know, look at what we're going to do today, and that is, you know, talking about those essays. Like many other fantasy authors of the last 70 years, so to speak, roughly 70 years, <laughs> um, Stephen R. Donaldson has written essays on what he tries to do when he's writing fantasy. Now, there's obviously a bunch of those out there. We've I've not spoken about them, but there's obviously um, um, J.R. Tolkien's On Fairy Stories. There's a bunch of essays by Ursula Le Guin. Um, there is Epic Pooh by um, <laughs> Michael Moorcock. And there's more of those. I mean, fantasy writers find themselves challenged with the question, like, what are you actually doing? And, you know... As a genre that is not that heavily studied by um, literary scientists, literary, um, you know, students of literary literature anywhere else, um, you know, they have to make it up as they go along. And that's what we get with those essays, I guess. Um, my point is, Stephen R. Donaldson wrote two of those essays in 1986 and one in 2015, where he basically looks at two things, and those are what is <laughs> the epic in epic fantasy, and what is the fantasy in epic fantasy? And um, he gives very specific answers, especially when it comes to what is fantasy. He has a very, I don't want to say idiosyncratic, but a very specific answer that does um, hold true for his own approach, obviously. But it's kind of difficult to see it applying to a lot of other fantasy out there. Nevertheless, it's worthwhile uh, to talk about that. And then he talks about the epic, and I think both of those aspects are important, and we're going to look at those, and then we'll see how much of that helps us understand his Thomas Covenant novels. So, let's try and do that. Then I'll, I'll do the other thing. <laughs> see, Stephen Donaldson goes first and looks at his definition of fantasy, and then he talks about the epic. But I do believe it's more important to look first at what he means when he talks about epic and then talk about his specific idea of fantasy because I feel it makes more sense that way around. Because his look at what epic fantasy or what epics in general do can be applied even if you use a different approach to what fantasy is. Which is interesting because when you read his second um, essay from 2015, he even points out that Stephen Erickson's Malazan Book of the Fall is a wonderful piece of epic fantasy um, that does not follow Stephen Donaldson's way of writing fantasy. <laughs> and then he goes to the epic. So that's a first structural thing that I'm going to do the other way around. So let's look at what he means or wh what his approach to the epic is. And that's, I think, a, a vital understanding or very important and looks, uh, you know, has important aspects on generally epic fantasy and all this stuff. So Donaldson looks at the English tradition of epics, which makes sense because, you know, 
That's his language. And um, he basically picks four um, epics, grand epics of the English language. Those being Beowulf, um, The Fairy Queen by Spencer, um, Paradise Lost by um, John Milton, and Idols of the King by Lord Tennyson. And um, I am not a scholar of English literature. Nevertheless, I have read both Beowulf and Paradise Lost. I even read Paradise Regained. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I try to do my home. No, I don't. <laughs> I have not read The Fairy Queen and I have not read um, Tennyson. And... Um, I'm aware of that. I roughly know what they're all about. If you want to see a fun <laughs> sword and sorcery and general fun look at the, at the Fairy Queen, there is Fletcher Pratt's and um, Sprague de Camp's uh, wonderful Complete Enchanter, the stories of Harry Shea, which do have a section about the Fairy Queen. And, you know, it's always worthwhile reading those. Anyway, my point is, those are the four big epics of the English language that um, Donaldson takes. And he builds a way, um, uh, like, a story of decline and fall, so to speak, um, of the English epic. And the thing he looks at is how is the role of humans in those stories and the role of magic in those stories. And his claim is that when we look at Beowulf, the first of those, it is all about humans. It's all about Beowulf. Now, Beowulf is obviously larger than life in a lot of ways, but he's a human and he has the power and the magic and all of that stuff is combined in the role of those characters in Beowulf. Humans can just walk out and slay monsters um, and their mums when they come and complain, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and that's wonderful. And um, then he, his claim is that when we move on to Spencer, the role of humans is already diminished within the epic. A lot of that stuff takes place in fairy country. We have, um, you know, in, in fairy. Uh, we have magical elements slowly moving away from the human elements. And when we move on to Paradise Lost, his claim is that humans really aren't that important for the story, and it's all about Satan and, and God, and humans are just the pawns on, on their game board, pushed around, and we could just, like, drop them and the story would still be great. Which I tend to agree. I mean, go and read Paradise Lost. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic, powerful poem. Um, Satan's kind of the cool guy <laughs> in, that, in that poem, um, which William Blake obviously remarked upon when he talked about like how Milton, being a true poet, obviously had to take the, the devil's side. And, I mean, it's also helpful to read William Blake from time to time, just saying. Um, and when we finally come to... Tennyson's Idols of the King, and I'm probably pronouncing that word wrong, which, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Point is, um, that one, he says, is basically an epic about how we can no longer have epics, and it is about King Arthur, about Arthur failing to, you know, elevate all these regular humans and into, like, an epic mode. Now, this is an interesting idea, because what we basically have is the magical, the magic and the human sphere, the epic sphere and the human sphere, overlapping completely in Beowulf and slowly separating further and further apart through time as we come closer to the today. And basically that's what um, his idea of the epic or the decline of the epic in the English language is. Now, does that also work in other languages? A good question. I think there's interesting aspects here that we should probably look at. One of them is the term disenchantment that we could probably drop from, you know, someone like Max Weber here, um, but should look at in a larger context. And that is, and, and that's sort of the big issue I have with Donaldson's essay, because he just can't, he just goes and says, like, yeah, that's that's what happened. And he doesn't ask the question, like, why is that the case? Now, obviously, he's writing a 20-page essay. Um, he's not writing a grand analysis of, the, of Western civilization or anything like that. But for his ongoing discussion or later stuff, I think it is important to look at, like, why? Why do we reach that point? Why, why 
do we get disenchanted, so to speak, and where where does the magic go? And that's something that he doesn't look at. And there's obviously a lot of things we can, um, you know, point to. We can look at like the rise of capitalism, which is, you know, what I always point to. But, like the rise of a modern society in a lot of ways through the Enlightenment, through um, the rise of capitalism, industrialization, all of those aspects of modern society did obviously um, add to that separation of the epic, the magical sphere, from the more human, um, everyday sphere. And an interesting book that you could go and read if you really want to, you know, dig through over a thousand pages of um, more or less good history of philosophy would be Charles Taylor's A Secular Age, um, which does exactly that which tries to look at like how did that disenchantment how did that happen how did we separate the secular sphere from the magical sphere the religious sphere the the epic the mythic sphere how did that happen and taylor points out a few interesting points one of them i think it's an interesting one when we look at like what we need to go in a moment here um is that partly that separating of those spheres was um, encouraged and built upon by both the Catholic Church and obviously the Anglican Church, which is basically Catholic Church for people um, who want to get divorces. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, and he, he makes a fairly convincing case on how on why that is the case. So the idea that we have is that in a time when Beowulf was written, in everyday life, um, the human and the magical sphere were still connected. And uh, Taylor has that wonderful idea where he talks about how um, um, our self was a porous self, which is how magic works, where things can interact on other things, both in like a magical thinking way, but also in a physical way, because those are still the same idea. We have the basically our self is a sphere, so to speak, and it is a porous sphere. And when something magical acts upon us, it basically enters our sphere and interacts with our self in a way because those are still thought of as the same thing, which is exactly what we see when we look at how um, Donaldson looks at a Beowulf and it's like the magic is in Beowulf. Beowulf can enact his magic upon other upon the world in a way and through the rise of you know natural sciences in the 15th 16th 16th century francis bacon the lot uh, those kind of people we begin and obviously the catholic church and then later on obviously and the, the anglican church following still more or less catholic dogma do try to uh, you know establish a more firm order of reality where these magical elements need to be pushed aside or put into like very specific rules, which is, you know, how you fight what you might call folk beliefs, what you, how you might call, you know, heresy, all of these other elements, they are pushed aside, which is where we come with something like Spencer, which does basically, and, um, and the Fairy Queen, which does basically talk about like how to live a good Christian life, which is where you relegate the magical sphere to somewhere that is no longer just fully you know our you know our sphere and then we move on to paradise lost which <laughs> separates those further and further and yet, then we obviously with the 17th and especially the 18th 19th century we do have that rise of industrialism that focus on like natural religion uh, natural science as the one model to explain the world the magic has been moved away we're just down here focusing on you know what you might call positivism, and how to live our lives down here. So I can see that part, and I think it's it's a bit of a shame that Donaldson doesn't point out that this um, moving away, this loss of the epic in epic fantasy, or in, you know, the loss of the epic is basically one of the aspects of that you know long process of disenchantment of our world, and. Um, that's so that's I think an important aspect of his essays to look at. And that's where we are. And I, I would agree up to a point um that his story of how we lost the epic in a way is is correct. 
and is an important important element on this longer narrative of like what we are doing out here when we are reading, telling, writing epic stories, epics in general, um, is, you know, is important. And now we come to his idea of what happens afterwards, which is J.R. Tolkien comes and reinvents the epic and writes the first epic after Tennyson. That's that's Donaldson's claim. Now, obviously, at this point, Philip Chase will will mention William Morris because he has to, <laughs> and um, that's fine. And you could go and talk about fairy stories like the ones that um, Lord Dunsany wrote and all of that. But the, the important aspect here is that, um, and that's Donaldson's claim, and there is truth to that that we can see in Tolkien, right? That the truth there is that Tolkien relegates his, his epic, his fantasy, to a secondary world, a different world. It's Middle Earth. It's it's separate from our world. And there's there's reasons why he does that. Um, in a lot of ways, Donaldson claims, yeah, that's the only way it was still possible to write an epic. It has to be in a different world. Um, when you read something like to uh, Tolkien's um, on fairy stories, you can see that Tolkien almost makes it, you know, he makes a lot of points like why the the fairy story or the fantasy has to be in a secondary world. It has to be in a different world because only there it can be what he calls a sub-creation where the author can actually be fully creative and do all these specific things that um, epics and fairy stories can achieve. It has to happen in a different world that the reader enters in a way, which is... You know, that's Tolkien, and we should probably spend more time talking about um, on fairy stories on a different occasion. But, you know, that's, that's I feel, important when we talk about what Donaldson then claims, where he's like, yeah, Tolkien had to write it there because that's the only way you could still write epics if it was very clear that they're not in our world. And then Donaldson's like, you know, what I'm doing is I'm slowly bringing it back um, by bringing the epic sphere closer to our world and reconnecting it to our world. Um, that's that's his big claim for epic fantasy that he does, which is where the term literature of reintegration happens. So it's like we need to reestablish a firm connection between the epic world, the world of the epic, and our daily world, our our human world. In a way, need to bring them closer together um, to actually make epics meaningful again. And this is, of course, the thing that I should have mentioned before, uh, but I'm mentioning it now, which is Stephen R. Donaldson claims that the epic has, by definition, has always dealt with the highest of questions. Epics are not about like where to get food in the morning and how to run your field. No, that's, um, well, that, that's Hesiod's works and days, which are, I guess, considered epic poetry, at least, you know, forget it. That's not my point. My point is, um, see how reading Secret History makes me drop the name Hesiod every point day now? It's terrible. <laughs> Don't read that book. My point is um, that the epic deals with questions of good and evil of life and death, the meaning of life, why are we here, how does this all work, the big questions, the epic questions, so to speak. And to make these meaningful, again, is sort of the claim that um, Stephen R. Donaldson makes, is, is epic fantasy has to come back to our world, has to be reconnected to ours, it has to re be reintegrated, which is what epic fantasy, in his view, is doing by kind of bringing it closer to our world, by making it very clear that epic fantasy stories are very much about our world and not just about Elfland, so to speak. All right, there we are with a first element. There's obviously other aspects to the idea of reintegration. One that I found interesting is that uh, the element of alienation that we also need to talk about, which is Donaldson also claims that contemporary literature is all about alienation. Um, and I think, I think he follows Tolkien in a way there, and a lot of fantasy authors, I've, I've done the same, it's like when we talk about contemporary literary fiction, we, we claim it's all boring, it's all drab, it's all depressing because it's all about 40-year-old dudes um, in Pittsburgh getting divorced, um, <clears throat> to paraphrase Michael Chabon. But 
there's obviously a point to the fact that modern, postmodern literature does often deal with futility, does deal with the fact that our world kind of sucks. And there's obviously historical reasons for that. And Tolkien was very aware of that and kind of dropped hints to that in something like On Fairy Stories. Donaldson just takes it as read that we know why this is the case, which I think is a bit of a weakness because claiming that modern literature sucks because it's all depressing and all about futility and then just like dropping uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, quote about man being a futile passion... It's a bit easy, but the point is, a lot of this literature, and there's an important element there that, like, even literary fiction, the way we know it nowadays, is very much a product of the 19th and 20th century. And the 20th century, in particular, has been pretty fucked up. And, you know, people going through World War One and World War Two. You kind of see their point when they think our world sucks and everything is shit, right? It's 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 kind of easy to see why that is the case, <laughs> and um, and I think that's um, that's something that well, as I said, Tolkien is aware of, but I don't think Donald. I mean. I, I would feel better if Donaldson would have ma mentioned that. Yeah, maybe there's reasons why literary fiction has moved or realist fiction or whatever you want to call it, mimetic fiction, has moved towards that idea. It's it's very much about seeing all your ideals crushed uh, by the machine of war and capitalism and the Cold War and all of that stuff. It, you, you can see a point why those people are that way. And I feel in a lot of ways that, oh, they're just writing depressing shit comes off as a bit like smug almost from like the, the fantasy side of things in a way. Anyway, the point is that Donaldson claims that our world, you know, is our stories are all about alienation, being alienated from the world, being alienated from our fellow humans and <laughs> nature and all of that. And that that's one element that we also can bring back with fantasy. And I've mentioned that for a reason because we're going to go there when we talk about obviously, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. And I think he picks up on something here, once again, that we find in Tolkien's On Fairy Stories, where, to, uh, where Tolkien talks about the fact that so often in fairy stories, um, humans can talk with animals. And we, I think Tolkien has a point there, despite, you know, him, you know, hating progress and shit. Um, and that is that there is, in all of us humans, there is that urge or that that need or that wish, that dream, uh, although dream is a bit of a difficult word here, to communicate with the rest of nature. We wish we could talk to animals. Wouldn't it be cool if my dog could tell me things that go beyond just looking at me, which doesn't help because I can't say, I mean, that's when I still had a dog. Point is, we wish that we could talk to animals because we wish to be in communication with nature and creation. So, I mean, creation is probably a term that someone like Tolkien would use. But it's, it is in there and it, it expresses itself sometimes in you know, being able to communicate with animals, speaking the tongues of animals in fairy stories. It's something that Tolkien claims. And I think it's something that, while Donaldson doesn't explicitly mention it in his both, both of his essays, it underlies that idea of overcoming that feeling of alienation that we have felt before and that has always sort of slightly been there in, in, in humans and has been much worse over the last century, two centuries, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> that has always still been possible in fairy, in fairyland, in, in elfland, in fantasy worlds. Bringing that bond back by bringing back the, yeah, elfland the land of fairy and the epic sphere in bringing it back into contact with human with the human sphere as Donaldson claims he's doing does also bring back at least the understanding that this is actually what we want these are stories that we want because these are dreams that we still have as humans we don't think i mean we might be faced with alienation every single day but that's not what we dream of that's not what is in our hearts and for that we need epic fantasy which then can heal, to bring up another term from from Tolkien's on fairy stories. Now, before we talk about that final part, which is obviously uh, Thomas Covenant, let's talk about Stephen R. Donaldson's definition of what fantasy is. And... Um, he tells, like, a funny anecdote and stuff, and he's like, yeah, my definition of fantasy, 
says Stephen R. Donaldson, is that fantasy is the externalization of internal processes. And that's, that's a very specific definition. He claims that realist contemporary fiction is very much the opposite. It's the internalization of external elements, where we see elements that are wrong in our world that are then um, talked through and thought through and argued through through the internal conflicts of the characters, whereas, so claims Stephen R. Donaldson, fantasy is the opposite. It's like we take the internal struggles of a character of what it means to be human, and we externalize them and give them characters, roles to play, um, f shape and action on the stage of fantasy. Now that obviously smacks of allegory, which is obviously bad, says Tolkien, and so we all agree. And so Donaldson's like, it's more than just allegory, and I, I do see his point, it is Ideally, it is more than allegory. It does descend into allegory sometimes when we have very narrow focus and a story with a very narrow focus. When we have something like Narnia, when we have something like um, Stephen R. Lawhead's, um, to who drew, <laughs> call in another Stephen, uh, Stephen R. Lawhead's um, um, in the Hall of the Dragon King. But those I mentioned for a reason. Those are religious allegories. And allegory is a language of religion, and there it has its place. In fantasy, it is a bit too narrow, because allegory has this one-on-one -on -one relationship with one specific element. It doesn't leave, leave, much, uh, leave much room to actually think, to uh, think around, to engage with. It is fairly clear for most readers um, what the allegory means, which can come across as fairly condescending too. So what, what Donaldson claims is an externalization of inner struggles on the stage of fantasy um, is what he does. And there's an, there's an interesting aspect to that, and I think it's important that we're reading this, um, that, that he wrote this in like 86, and then once again 2015, but mostly he talks about that in 86. And that is um, the introduction or the invasion of uh, Jungian archetypes and stuff into the fantasy world via our good friend Joseph Campbell, right? <laughs> Who does pull in those when he talks about specific elements and tales. And once again, um, I'm not claiming that Donaldson has all of these things explicitly in there because he doesn't do that, but it kind of, you can read those elements in. <laughs> so there is a a weird thing there because a Stephen R. Donaldson book, and that's where we're going in a minute, can be read as a fantasy story going on where all the things happening in the fantasy land, the giants, the blood guard, the wonderful horses, all of that stuff is basically just um, all the things that happen in the mind of Thomas Covenant when he's trying to come to terms with the fact that he's got leprosy and everyone hates him and fears him. And that's that's an interesting way of doing fantasy, and I'm, I'm I mean, Stephen O'Donnell is aware of the fact that that's only his approach, or maybe some other people's approach as well, but it's not the only approach to writing fantasy. It's certainly a very interesting one, and it helps us. I think that's that's where we, where I'll try to tie all these things together. It helps us in understanding what he's trying to do with the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, and it also gives us a re way to look at like whether he succeeds with the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, and why maybe his approach to fantasy does leave some parts of those first novels, the first chronicles, somewhat bland. Because I think um, that Stephen R. Donaldson is trying a bit too much in those first chronicles of Thomas Covenant. And it's very clear. It's like, yeah, you know, I deliberately set it up the other way around. Thomas Covenant is the one real person who has to go into fantasy land. That's a mirror, basically, of Arthur being the one magical person and all these other people around him being very grubby, normal humans in Tennyson's ed uh, Idyls of the King. And... Yeah, that's that, that's great, um, but I feel that's exactly what he's doing. He's trying a bit too hard. Now we go into that fantasy land, and Thomas Covenant is trying to figure out whether he's actually whether the land is actually really can't actually accept fantasy. That, that struggle that that Donaldson diagnosed in humanity's relationship 
to the epic sphere is very much the personal struggle of Thomas Covenant trying to reconnect to the fantastic, to the imagination. But it's also obviously um, expressed in Thomas Covenant having that um, terrible sickness, having, uh, having suffering from leprosy, being ostracized from society. All these elements come in there as well. And I think it's, especially in those first three novels, it sometimes feels like it's trying a bit too hard because, you know, there's, there's all these symbols, all these things that can be seen as symbols, that should be seen as symbols. And suddenly it's a bit overburdened while at the same time feeling oddly bland, which I mentioned when I talked about um, those chronicles yesterday. Now, there's another thing that we need to talk about, which I didn't talk about yesterday, and that's Lena. Because if all, all the things happening in the first chronicles of Thomas Covenant are an externalization, an external working through the inner struggles of Thomas Covenant, the unbeliever, what does that make the rape of Lena? Is that also just an external way of looking at an inner struggle? And obviously, there's the problem that, you know, sexual assault has been used as a metaphor for all kinds of things over the centuries. But to use it basically as a symbol, and I, I, once again, I can't say allegory because it's not an allegory, but it, it's sort of like looking at it looking at it as a symbolized, highly symbolized um, archetypal working through a specific element of Thomas Covenant's struggle. Kind of is weird. I don't know. It, 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 you know, with poetic license, you can do whatever the fuck you want. That's fine. It just kind of rubs me the wrong way because it does, on one hand, kind of explain why we never get Lena's perspective on the whole thing. We only get Thomas Covenant's perspective on it. Um, it does obviously, you know, reduce uh, th these things to just, you know, to ciphers, basically. Lena is just like innocence um, and enthusiasm. And it gets destroyed by... An, uh... In a way, it does, you know... I don't want to say normalize or anything. It, it does, it can be seen in a way of devaluing the actually, the actual problem that is sexual assault in a lot of ways, because we see a lot of, you know, sexual violence and other, other works of fantasy. And I don't know, <laughs> should we actually read those as well in that way? I, I found that, I found that very difficult and I'd, I'd really love to, you know, actually, you know, work through that in my brain, but I'm, I'm struggling with that. <clears throat> but once again, I feel it helps to understand <clears throat> these these things. Like Donaldson claims that, you know, that, that element of magic is in us. We need to reconnect to that. Magic is our, our ability <clears throat> to create, to sub-create. Um, that elvish craft, as Tolkien calls it in his on fairy stories. That's that's the magic, and that's what we see at the end of Thomas Covenant, the um, of um, the power that preserves. When we find that the wild magic is in Thomas Covenant, it is his imagination, it is fantasy, his imagination that he can then use. And for that, obviously, it is very significant that Covenant, as a character, is a writer. So we know he has used his magical powers before before the stories even start and then he lost then he lost that magical power through his uh, sickness and all the things that happened through society and now he's slowly regaining it so you can see Thomas Covenant's arc character arc throughout the first trilogy as another mirroring of the loss of the epic sphere to humanity through disenchantment and the slow regain so the ending of the power that preserves should also see could also be read as a positive hope for the future that we rekindle that inner magic and imagination and bring the epic sphere and our sphere closer through what you might call re-enchantment. Now that's been a lot of waffling by me. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Um, did I go completely off the rails here? I don't know, let me know in the comments. And uh, yeah, I'd, uh, you know, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe. I don't know, join the Patreon if you feel like it. 
all of those things. And once again, thanks for watching. Cheers.